welcome everybody. I'm happy to have you here for this afternoon's lecture in the, the fifth one in the series on taking action on climate change. Excellent. Uh, we would just like to acknowledge that we are on, on, on unceded Coast Salish territory and acknowledge that Tsleil-Waututh, uh, Musqueam, and Squamish peoples, and in fact, go a step further, we're going to ask Reuben George from the Tsleil-Waututh Nation uh, to come up and say a few words of welcome. So it's a real pleasure to have Reuben here. I said, hello. <laughs> um, you know, I, I have a son who's, who's 18, I have a daughter who's 16. And uh, I watched some of you, I read some of your work and I watched some of your videos. And, and it was pretty similar when my, when my kids were little, I'd read them a book or tell them a story. You know, just, I'll make up stories too about the salmon and how it, it will jump out of its element into the air or go from fresh water to salt water and it'll persevere for a Romeo Juliet story in their little bits and it swims all this distance of the Pacific all the way up the rivers to spawn and find the perfect partner and have some babies and you know but we, we took those those lessons of nature and I sort of planted those seeds in, in, in my kid's head you know and my, my daughter started Recognize that she became part of ceremonies and she started sun dancing, started being part of her longhouse. She's 16 years old, just coming on her fourth year of ceremony and sun dancing. And not long ago, about a month ago, she got 11 letters from um, 11 different universities asking her to apply. She's disappointed because there's no Ivy League there, and I was like, "You're only grade 10, so you have two years." And um, I was so proud of her, you know. I was so proud of her, and what made me more proud. She, she came in and, she, and, I, and I was talking about what she wanted to do and I remember when she was 12 she was reading on in the right conditions how jellyfish and lobsters in the right conditions could live for thousands of years. Then about a year ago she's telling me how our nerves will, will create new skin when they're in, in, and how a woman's moon time or period create, the nerves create a, a new egg. And, and so she's thinking about combining those things and, and seeing how she, she, she can sustain her dad's life. <laughs> so I thought that was really neat. And then what was more impressive about that, she approached me a couple months ago and she said, you know, Dad, you know what's going to dictate my path? is our culture and our spirituality. And I look at the work that you've done, you talked about I don't know more. And you, and, and you look at... You know, 1930 wasn't, wasn't that long ago where 80% of indigenous people in Canada went to residential school. And 80% and, and, um, all across Canada. And 50% of them died before 19 years old. That's a big chunk of our population. And things are similar and are still helping like that. I was director of community development for my nation and I was director of Off Reserve too. You, you get between $150 and $210 in social assistance when you're living on reserve compared to $550 to $1,200 living off reserve. So some of those things are still happening. And then anyway, so when, when I look at my own life, or, or my brother's life, or, or the, my community members in Tislewitu Nation, they, um, they follow the same path. I became a family therapist. I never ever compromised their culture and spirituality. Actually, I took it a, a, a step further. My grandfather, Chief Dan George, he said, Anything you learn in college and university about healing, there's a native teaching that says the same thing. I created them. I, I hired two psychologists and about ten elders, and, and we put that to the test. And, and, and it was it was simple. And I was working on the same ideas of a psychologist in the 1920s. His name was Liv Vygotsky in Russia, and he studied people with culture and without culture. And the outcomes were simple. The ones that had culture in life lived longer, were more successful, less stressed, and a whole bunch of good things. So with that idea of what, what my grandfather said, we looked at models, and then I, I went to different conferences and I saw this incredible um, teacher, he's Navajo, and he was teaching all native kids, 80% were failing. He took every experiment, every, every part of what he was working on, and he incorporated his Navajo culture into it. Within six months, 80% were passing. Even teachers that were teaching their own language, kids with speak, speech impediments speaking English didn't have a speech impediment when they're speaking their own native language. 
So all these cities started coming about and, and sort of, you know, with the legends and stories of who we are as the slave to people, sort of to surface in my career. Like, as you see in the beginning of the week, there was a, a couple of killer whales that came into the inlet. You know, um, my great, great, great grandfather, when he passed away, they, they did a traditional burial and they put him out in the ocean. And they, and they sent him out. And then they said the blackfish came and took him. And as the killer whale, they took him out. And since then, they never ever came back except for four times. Two times when, when two different chiefs passed away of hereditary. And then recently again. And, and then how they came back coincided with a Lummi teaching, just our neighbors right across the border, about how the fish are going to come back and wildlife are going to come back and they're going to help us. And it goes along with the story my grandfather said, and he said, um, the enemies my children will face are going to be far worse than the enemies that I fought. Because the enemies that we'll face are, are, are drugs and alcohol and greed and fossil fuels and things like this. But he said, we'll, we'll, we'll use help. And those coincided with the stories in Lummi, coincided with our Tisleowichi stories, and they said the killer wolves will come back. So we take those ideas of what we built Tisleowichi in, what my grandfather said, and how my uncle Len led us. And so we never compromised who we were and how we conducted ourselves. Like the environmental work that I do, it's the same thing. We don't compromise. When people came and asked us for help, we said, well, let us show you why first. So there's about 20 environmentalists, Ben West and one of the founders of Greenpeace, Rex Weiler, and they all came to ceremony for about two months. They said, well, we'll show you first. Show you why. So, you know, you can read and find some knowledge of what you're doing, but we're going to share with you why we do what we do, and we're going to give you some wisdom. Put some action behind our words and have you be a part of it. And they did. And then even in our economic development, we, 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 we don't compromise our, who we are as indigenous people. So what happened collectively, you know, as a nation, I'm so proud of them. Our Samicon 10 years ago was down to 3,000. Because to stay with efforts and how important salmon is to us, 85% of our diet was seafood. In 10 years, the efforts in our Samicon went up to 100,000. The elk reintroduction program that we did with partners, has, has bringing back wolves. I don't know if you've seen this uh, really neat little documentary on, on Yellowstone Park about how the impact of wolves brought to that area. You know, it, it stabilized the, 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 the deer and elk had eaten the vegetation, so it stabilized the rivers, and brought back more plants, brought back different flowers, brought back more wild things, or brought back more birds. So it completed the ecosystem more, and, and, and we started these things about 20 years ago, and it's been, it's, we're having success with that. The elk are bringing back wolves. Squamish did the same thing. It's brought back wolves up to Squamish, and it's completing things. Well, that's embedded in who we are. We don't ask, we don't ask, should we do this? Or should we? It's just embedded in who we are. And it started when I was at a young age, when my mother did the same thing as me, where she told me the legends and stories, the morals and values and lessons of the things that surround us that start to create our governance of who we are, that start to create our laws. The Salish Sea Treaty that we created was, was created by spiritual elders from the, the local nations here, Musqueam, Tisleu, Squamish, and Lummi, Tulela. It was based on our traditional laws. When our chief read out that statement, she said, we recognize our cultural and our spiritual teachings as the highest court and the highest law of our people. And we said, you know, Kinder Morgan, you're breaking our laws. Everything that we get out of the water is simple, it's good. 85% of our diet was out of the water. Sustenance is what we get out of the water. We, we are, it's the highways of our people. We, we travel through those waters. And the only thing that we believe that should be going back into the water are good things as well. So I'm, I'm happy to come here today and I'm happy to learn. Um, as we were just talking about the yesterday and, and, and here, here you are. And so on behalf of the Tisleo Nation, it's right in our backyard here. And in and, and Musk, and Musqueam, my relations, and Squamish, my dad's family, we welcome you here. Each and every one of you, we welcome you here. And John, we welcome you and thank you, Lynn and, and Stephen, for, for organizing this. You know, one thing that I think of is, um, you know, when, when we talk about ceremony, when we talk about your connection to your own spirit that you sit with, when we talk about your connection to your ancestors, 
When we talk about your connection to Creator, when you learn those things, you learn to have connection to Earth. And you know, when we try to explain that, that's like almost trying to explain to somebody what it's like to be in love when that person hasn't been in love. That's what it's like. But after watching you speak and seeing some of those things you do, especially working in academics, you know, you're, you're, you're a good hero of mine and you do that very well. So, so thank you all very much for giving me this opportunity to welcome you to our general territory and welcome John. Ozi. So, very briefly, a little bit of formalities. We hop up and down here for a minute. Um, I would like to welcome uh, President Andrew Gunner from SFU, who, of course, this is a president's dream colloquium. This is Andrew's dream realize. I hope so. You're dreaming, but um, but, but uh, it's also his money we're spending. So, please welcome Andrew Gunner. I'm awake now, but you can see I've been fighting the good fight for SFU. So. Um, I know that we're here to hear John Morrow, so I will not go on for long. I just want to say how excited I've been by both Green Colloquia series uh, this spring. It's just been great. This series on uh, obedience and disobedience, taking action on climate change, the other series on protecting indigenous cultural heritage. Uh, they've both been great, and we've had sellouts for some of them and, and well attended lectures for almost all of them. I just want to put in a plug for the, uh, the next uh, lecture on March 25th in the other series. It is sold out. It's with Linda uh, Tahiwai Smith, but it's going to be webcast live. So even though you can't get tickets if you don't already have them, you can watch it live on webcast, and it should be just uh, a wonderful uh, lecture. And then, of course, we have the youth panel coming up here as the next one. So another not to miss uh, event in what has just been a great series. Uh, yeah, I put up a little bit of dodge for the President's office, but the real effort in making this series work is the organizational effort of, uh, of uh, Lynn and, and Stephen and others who have helped you, the support of the Graduate Studies Office and Gladys, and uh, we all owe a huge debt of gratitude to you for having uh, made it possible for us to enjoy this lecture series. Finally, I have to say a word about my friend John Worrells. John uh, and I kind of got together and we both ended up at UVic Law around the same time. Uh, John is an amazing academic uh, and has made huge contributions to uh, both Indigenous and knowledge, but also knowledge of Indigenous peoples on the part of all Canadians, indeed all North Americans. Did remarkable work and is back at UVic Law doing remarkable work. And here's, here's the thing I'm really happy about. John has agreed to become a visiting faculty member for the next few years, at least, in our new Aboriginal Executive MBA program, a first of its kind, and thank you, John, for doing that. It's fabulous for SFU to have that connection. And you'll find out why now, because I'm going to turn over the microphone to someone who's going to introduce uh, the wonderful, remarkable John Burroughs. Okay, I too will keep my comments brief. Um, John has a remarkable and distinguished uh, record, and I'm just going to mention a few highlights. As Dr. Petter just mentioned, he's uh, currently a CRC chair at the University of Victoria in Indigenous uh, Law, and also uh, a visiting professor here at SFU, which we're all very thrilled about. He has been uh, on a faculty and visiting professor at, I didn't count them, but many universities around the world, including Australia and New Zealand. And when I dug a little deeper, um, it's very apparent that Dr. Burroughs is in high demand as someone to bring in and help uh, get new programs on board. He's obviously someone who makes things happen. Um, he teaches in the areas of constitutional law, indigenous law, and environmental law. And he has published several books. Um, some of the names, Recovering Canada, The Resurgence of Indigenous Law, which was uh, won an award as the best Canadian political science book in 2002. And in 2011, his book, um, Canada's Indigenous Constitution, won also a best book award from the Canadian Law, Law and Society. So that 
that is really cool. And uh, uh, there's a companion book that he published in 2010 called Drawing Out the, the Law, A Spirit's Guide. And I just want to read a short uh, blurb about that book because I think it kind of summarizes uh, why I'm excited for this lecture, although I don't want to make us wait too much longer. <laughs> okay, it, it, this innovative work combines fictional and non-fictional elements in a series of connected short stories that symbolize different ways of Anishinaabek engagement with the world. Drawing on oral traditions, pictographic scrolls, dreams, common law case analysis, and philosophical reflection. Isn't that a wonderful package of things? Uh, Borrow's narrative explores issues of pressing importance to the future of indigenous law and offers, new re and offers readers new ways to think about the direction of Canadian law. So Professor Borrow's is a recipient of an Aboriginal Achievement Award in Law and Justice. He's also a fellow of the Academy of Arts, Humanity, and Sciences in Canada. So for those of you who don't know, that is about as good as it gets um, in the academic world in, in terms of recognition and accolades. Um, he's also a recipient of the Indigenous Peoples Council and the Indigenous Bar Association. Uh, and that was an honor bestowed on him for his integrity in service to Indigenous communities. So John is an Anishinaabe Ojibwe, and he's a member of the Chippewa of the Nawash First Nation in Ontario. And it's my great honor to bring you Professor John Burroughs. Abuju Nidinue Magani Dok, Nietzsche Nishnabe Nietzsche Marzig, Bangieta Goninata Nishnabem, Giguji Tunjisha Moyan, Giganos Nijnakas, Neashi Winigaming and Donjaba, Nigigan Dodem. I'm really grateful for the invitation that I received to be able to be with you today. I thank, I'm thankful for the welcome to this territory from Ruben. I'm thankful for the president and Lynn and Stephen for making this opportunity available. I'm really excited to be able to talk about this subject. And you'll see in the background here pictures of my reserve and territory and family as I'm uh, giving a talk uh, now. What my subject is is, of course, Indigenous people's law as it relates to climate change and civil disobedience. And I want to place this uh, topic in a relational mode. And I hope that I can give a very Anishinaabe talk today. We're also called the Ojibwe or the Chippewa people. And we live about four hours north of Toronto on the Bruce Peninsula, which is on the shores of Georgian Bay and Lake Huron. And in giving this talk in an Anishinaabe way, there's going to be some loose ends. There's not everything going to be necessarily knit together. There's going to be places where there's gaps and um, things that need to be pieced together by you. And that's uh, part of what happens within an indigenous legal tradition is that your own role in interpretation, your own role in drawing conclusions and making judgments is a critical part of uh, this legal tradition because it's very participatory and it requires engagement and it requires mutuality and it requires us uh, um, being with one another in this relational way. Some of this talk will thus be very much uh, um, on an edge of things. Others, there will be aspects that are integrated. Now, this is storytelling season for the Anishinaabe. If we were back in Ontario, we'd still find snow in places and cold uh, much uh, around the edges. And I want to begin with one of these stories. It comes from Ningodwasa Dasadguni Gunungizis, which is Anime E Gizigat Ishka Mikizame Gizis, April 6th, and it's Mijikwat Agwa Jing. They used to be called the Water Walkers, and now I'm one of them. Only I'm 100 years too late. The Great Lakes were their home, inland seas as big as the sky. And they lived here from time of memory. They sang for the waters. They cleansed themselves on her shores. They prayed, they fasted, and they drummed for her. And they did all they could to protect her. They even gave their lives for her. And when they could do no more, they walked. And they followed her every contour. Walking on the edge of life, they crossed many bounds. They were a people on the edge, and that put them at the center of the world. They walked through sand, 
They crossed marshes and they stumbled along rocky coasts and seasons were their companions. Ziguanong, Nibanong, Togakanong, Nibanong. Winds were their lovers. Wabanong, Jawanong, Ningabinong, Giwetanong. And I am their child. But now they're gone. And I'm 100 years too late. And I feel alone. But I walk on. I follow trackless trails. And I listen for their voices. And I watch for their signs. Above me, the sky is black tonight. But the southern horizon still burns red. The path of souls strewn across the heavens touches that land of the dead. It arches through the sky across endless space. But even that path seems empty. There seem to be no more walkers. The Milky Way is truly now the ghost road. Jibai Mikana. Everyone seems to have crossed over but me. At least that's my guess. They've already walked that path above me, rising from that crimson rim to the south, and they walked north, Giwetanong, the go-home direction. They left their bodies, and they walked out of this world, draining the earth of its inhabitants. And the fires from the Jaganash city still burn red. They've been burning for years. Everything to the south of here seems wasted. Shawnee, Haudenosaunee, Illinois lands. They're almost devoid of life. Buffalo, Cleveland, Chicago, Milwaukee, Duluth, they're gone. And all the in-between places are vacant. And they're just piles of concrete and asphalt and metal, these once upon a time urban lands. And I've walked past the shores of the mall. I'll never return to those southern places, though they'll always return to me. They stalk my sleeping mind. They haunt my daytime journeys. The entire Great Lakes watershed is now a graveyard. And I've seen too much death for one person. So I stay north. I walk the Ontario shores of our Anishinaabe homelands. When the snows fly, I, shut, I huddle by Georgian Bay waters. My winter lodge is between Gitchiname Wequidone and Name Wequidone. The lands between Owen Sound and Wyerton are sacred places for me, as they have been for generations. By the slough of despond and in the caves and shadows of the escarpments, I find a measure of rest. All the while, through each season, I pray for the water. Like her Nakomisanan, I drum for the water. I sing for her. I put down my tobacco in thanksgiving for her. And in return, she feeds me body and mind and spirit, though only just barely, because a dark, oily skin lies on her surfaces. It leeches from most every urban coast. I still find birds covered in black. Insects and small animals are continually ensnared in the mess. I know when I'm approaching a dead zone, you can smell the fish before you can see them. A few large scavengers take up their bodies. They bloat and decay for weeks before their bones bleach in a very wan and distant sun. But there are places where the water is still clearer, and that's where my prayer turns to joy. Sometimes I walk for days on near pristine coasts. Ducks, seagulls, and geese, geese gather at these shores, they are at these river mouths. The air is filled with their songs, though I haven't heard a robin for quite some time. Carp, sucker, bass, they can be found here too. And there are enough black flies that they rise up off the land in great curtains. And mosquitoes, they give their life to this sacred circle. They have actually fared the best. They now rule this place. And it's a wonder to see the grass and shrubs and trees swarming with their might and dominion. The waves at my camp are gentle tonight. 
It is Iskegemizage Gizis, the sap boiling moon. The air is warm for early spring. It's been about a month since the ice has retreated, and I have much work to do. My, the bush is full of my buckets and kettles. I'll need that sugar for my summer's journeys. I'm living a seasonal round, just like before the others arrived and started this process, which returned us to the sky. It's late, and I must sleep. I walked with the water again today. It goes uphill this time of year. Water rarely travels this way, but it's natural in this case. Unlike most other things around here, the water reverses its flow when warming days meet cold nights. It's forced up solid tree trunks. And I welcome this explosion of energy in my waning world. Sap is drawn towards the sun. It emerges at winter's end when life is most challenging. And I tap the maple and birch trees to catch all the sap that I can. And as I walk between the trees, I sing the old songs. My voice carries the water song, the morning song, the sugar making song. I echo my grandmother's tunes. And sometimes their songs join me on the rising winds. I feel sometimes like they walk with me, though I know they're long gone. Before it happened, water walkers journeyed in all four directions. About 100 years ago, they came from the east down the St. Lawrence River to Lake Ontario. They moved up from the south, up the Mishazee Bee, the Mississippi, to Lake Superior. They traveled from the west along the Missouri and other great streams. Others walked from the north along the Saskatchewan, Assiniboine, Rainy, and Sturgeon rivers. They were engaged in direct action. They hauled water in copper kettles from the Atlantic Ocean, Gulf of Mexico, Pacific Ocean, and Hudson's Bay. And they poured these waters into the Great Lakes watershed at their journey's end. Their point was that life is one. Water is an inseparable part of life, no matter where we live. And yet, we failed, it seems, to learn this lesson. Earth's veins are congealing. They're choked with oil, pesticides, pharmaceuticals, and sewage. Waterborne diseases swim through the muck. But today, it was a good day. What might hurt me is boiled away, and I'm left with this refining process. Sap is purified as it distills. My kettles are safe when I'm done. I'm left with this fresh flowing syrup. syrup. It sustains me. Drinking it feels almost perfect. And then I walk on. And I'm brought back to reality. I pass the skeletons of former life. Ontario has died. And I'm not sure what's replacing it. Unseen battles rage beyond my vision. Viruses, bacteria, parasites are transforming my homelands. And I can't tell who's winning. And I'm not sure who will be victorious or if it'll ever end. And I don't know who to cheer for. The world is not what it seems. But returning home this evening, the smell of life, of new life, crossed my path, and I found footsteps down near the shore. Dawn soaked the sky as I emerged from my lodge. My breath escaped in large clouds. Rocks sang under my feet as I made my way to the shore. A few ducks floated in the distance. The call of seagulls could be heard down the coast. I always love this time of day, the promise of life behind each sunrise. And I look down. A mass of fresh footprints disappears at the water's edge. And so I put down my tobacco. Land and sky bled into the water as I offer my morning prayer. <laughs> 
Miigwech nishomasunan, ogi ba wasaya jayan nungom. Miigwech indikid nungom gijigak. Miigwech kiskomasunan ga dbein danga ki. Miigwech ogi mijan minaba marzuin. Miigwech ogi mijan nibe mijim. Miigwech ogi mijan is awain si yag ne sewin. A seiman da bagadanan danasun danamak. Wabanon, jaonon. Ngabi nong, gi wait nong. We do kawashin jamash kugabi weong. Minawa jazunga de eong. Mi gwech na mishomas. Mi gwech na komas. The philosopher Hannah Arendt once observed that the raison etre of politics is freedom and its, ex its field of experience is action. She said to be free and to act are the same thing. And I agree with her words. Freedom is an embodied experience and is evidenced in public settings. It is relational. In Anishinaabe Moin, such freedom can be more particularly described as Debain Nindizuin, which means a person possesses liberty in their selves and in their relationships. Freedom has a sui generis, property-like, connotation in the Ojibwe language. That is, it implies that a free person owns and is responsible for and controls how they interact with others. The same word can be used to describe someone who is a member of a group. Thus, the, the name for a citizen in Anishinaabemowin is Dbejigazawin one who controls or owns or has stewardship for their associations. When I think about examples of Anishinaabe freedom to live well and its relationship to civil disobedience, I'm drawn to tales of our trickster, Nana Bojo. His stories illustrate a tradition of action. They do not engage in abstract philosophizing or rigid behavioral codes. Our trickster is not an ideal character. He does not always model exemplary behavior. We learn as much from his flaws and his imperfections as we do through his heroism and great deeds. And he constantly is on the move from place to place to place, encountering many who challenge his liberty. His life is fluid, and his actions and responses are varied and even unpredictable. His events, his life illustrates that wherever he goes as the transformer, there's always consequences that follow his actions. He cannot do, despite his great power, exactly what he wants. His actions are always constrained in some way. At the same time, he has many options for living a good life because of his ability to transform himself and the relations of those around him. He's free, even though as real world relationships will facilitate and constrain his scope of action. Water walkers and the trickster illustrate the relational context in which direct action and civil de disobedience might occur. Because we don't have to accept the world as we find it. We can challenge and change how and where we live and think and speak, at least to a degree. Freedom allows us to question the limits of our lives while at the same time helping to reach beyond them. But it's hard work, and there are limits to what we can accomplish. Many of these limits might even be healthy and facilitate our happiness and well-being. Thus, the quest for freedom and a good life within Anishinaabe law simultaneously exalts and resists what we consider to be universally true. In my view, freedom is strongest when it's publicly interactive and aimed at living well together. The Anishinaabe call this minobamadizuin. In a relational context, the freedom to live a good life becomes a democratic activity, simultaneously individual and collective, because there is no relationship-free place for indigenous peoples, 
or for other peoples, whether positively or negatively or mixedly construed. Because as you know, indigenous peoples' lives are shot through with the relations of inequality, force, fraud, broken promises, failed accords, degrading stereotypes, misrecognition, paternalism, enmity, and distrust. At the same time, Anishinaabe lives are saturated with Nibwa Kawin, wisdom, Zagidawin, love, Mananain Dimwin, respect, Akwadizuin, bravery, Dabadain Dizuin, humility, Gwekwadizuin, honesty, and Dbwewin, truth. The same is true for all humankind. And these practices that I've described, wisdom, love, respect, bravery, humility, honesty, and truth, these are the seven grandmother and grandfather teachings of the Anishinaabe people. They allow groups and individuals to take direct action in structuring their responsibilities for daily living. They help people live in free and responsible ways. However, these teachings do not presume to provide precise answers to any given question. And thus, dissent becomes a very important practice of Anishinaabe law. And dissent can lead to freedom if its strength is directed towards the pursuit of a good life, minopomadazuin, with its many paths and meanings. However, unqualified dissent for its own sake, detached from conduct and regarded as an absolute value, can ensnare people and nations in its grip, its conceptual grip. In my view, avenues to freedom and a good life are forged through both a context-dependent dissent and agreement. The intermingling of dissent and agreement makes civil disobedience and direct action a messy affair. Because our laws, as with most people's laws on the earth, can be competing as well as complementary, sometimes even at the same time. They cannot be simplified for the sake of a singular conception of the good life, because this would diminish freedom in pursuing our very goals. For some indigenous peoples, disobedience to Canadian law, as interpreted by governments, could well be obedience to indigenous law. Furthermore, in some situations, so-called civil disobedience could also be characterized as obedience to Canadian law, as it should be, if such laws applied indigenous legal perspectives. In this light, indigenous peoples often engage in pragmatic, nonviolent action if the country's rules of law, management, and ethics do not create sufficient space to resist domination. And some of you as part of this seminar have read a paper that I've written that chronicles 15 instances of indigenous peoples engaging in this kind of direct action. Haida, James Bay, Oka, Burnt Church, Anishinaabe Park, Sun Peaks, Gustasun Lake, Grassy Narrows, um, Lubicon, Ipperwash, Kawa, Donia, etc. Direct action attempts to pry open new spaces of engagement and turn oppression on its head. In some small measure, civil disobedience allows a subjugated group to reflect back to the dominating party the experience of being oppressed. For example, just as Canadian law has severely constrained indigenous physical and social mobility, indigenous people's strategic blockade of Canadian sites challenges the mobility of other Canadians. Blockades are intentionally spatial practices, as Nicholas Blomley observes. The constraints on movement that Canadians feel that are enforced by blockades focuses attention on the mobility restrictions faced by Indigenous peoples themselves. Blocking the flow of people and commerce reverses and challenges our society's colonial structures and the constraints that indigenous peoples face all the time on their mobility. 
The effects of these direct actions on others, on other Canadians, should not be overlooked. And while they can be minuscule in comparison to governmental restrictions, they are nevertheless significant. As Jean Sharp observed, when people refuse their cooperation, withhold their help, and persist in their disobedience and defiance, they are denying their opponent the basic human assistance and cooperation which any government or hierarchical system requires. And if they do this in sufficient numbers for long enough, the government or hierarchical system will no longer have power to a certain degree. But I must stress that this kind of engagement is relational. It does have an interdependence built into it. If exercised peacefully to establish a less oppressive engagement, we can conclude that civil disobedience can contribute to our democratic character, our aspirations. But as you know, democracy and freedom are not always facilitated by this practice. Civil disobedience can become unproductive, undemocratic, when it's detached from specific political context and idealized as a universal solution. When this occurs, civil disobedience can result in further oppression and undermine people's attempts to lead a good life. This despite its, its potential. That is, just like the trickster, civil disobedience has its limits. Like other legal practices, it can't be taken out of its context. It has to be practiced with calibrated care, devoting strict attention to the particular context in which it's employed. Because it generates grave misunderstandings in some circumstances. And it causes toxic backlash. Direct action, as I repeat, is never unilateral. It's always inserted into a wider context by the group controlling it. So care has to be taken not to romanticize direct action and civil disobedience as the ideal, a priori, universal, fundamentalist path to freedom. Nor should we completely reject it. It depends on the context. Unfortunately, some people seem to treat civil disobedience in the way that some indigenous lawyers might view rights as the thing that must always be applied. It becomes the answer to all problems, and its widespread use is often heralded in absolutist terms. I sometimes see a cult of self-sufficiency through direct action as some communities pick up on this and transform it from its specific context, in my view, into a false, idealized, platonic, universal form, thereby closing off other avenues to freedom. In the case R versus Oaks, the Supreme Court of Canada described the values of a free and democratic society. It said it included, quote, the respect for the inherent dignity of the human person, commitment to social justice and equality, accommodation of a wide variety of beliefs, respect for cultural and group identity, and faith in social and political institutions which enhance the participation of individuals and groups in society. Just like the grandfather and grandmother teachings, one might expect that civil disobedience informed by these practices would encourage a more productive relationality. Now, in deciding a case about uh, Indigenous civil disobedience during a particularly intractable dispute, a motions judge of the Ontario court wrote this, quote, there can only be one law and that is the law of Canada expressed through this court, end quote. This is a narrow view of Canadian law. It does not reflect the richness of Canada's legal inheritance. Therefore, it's a false tradition in my view. There are three 
constitutionally significant strands of law in Canada, the common law, the civil law, and indigenous law. And these laws are not always expressed through the courts, parliament, and the legislatures. And when indigenous peoples participate in so-called civil disobedience, as I've mentioned, this action can sometimes be in obedience to indigenous law. It is the manifestation of practices of indigenous law. There are other instances, though, where courts have been a little bit more generous in thinking about how these traditions interact together. The Ontario Court of Appeal, in rejecting that idea of one law for all, as is expressed only through the courts, said this. Other dimensions of the rule of law also have a significant role. These other dimensions include respect for minority rights, reconciliation of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal interests through negotiations, fair procedural safeguards for those subject to criminal proceedings, respect for the Crown and police discretion, respect for the separation of the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government, and respect for Crown, and I might add, Aboriginal property rights. There are other statements that we could draw from the courts that are more accurate reflections of this idea that's sometimes thrown at us, that there's one law for all, that only the courts, legislation, or parliament has the opportunity to participate in. Anishinaabe people have law, and we learn this law from the environment and the climates that we experience. Key legal concepts are inspired by the world around us, and they are embedded in the Anishinaabe language. The earth and the words used to describe her suggest standards about how we are to regulate our behavior and resolve our disputes. We've long taken direction about how we can live by analogizing our behaviors to what we see in the natural world around us. We take guidance, regulatory authority from the behavior of the sun and the moon, the stars, the winds, the waves, the trees, the birds, the animals, and other natural phenomena. And you've seen the otter up here, my clan. Other animals can be looked at to understand what our responsibilities are. This word is akinomagewin which literally is formed from two roots, eke and nomage. Eke means earth. Nomage means to point towards or take direction from. Thus, teaching and learning about law literally means the lessons we learn from pointing to and taking direction from the earth. These analogies that I talked about earlier. Chief Gary Potts of the Tamagami Anishinaabe illustrated this through an experience he told about, in his, about his own territory. I quote, I remember once coming across an old white pine that had fallen in the forest. In its decayed roots was a young birch and a young black spruce, and they were growing up together, healthy and strong. The pine tree was returning to the earth and two totally different species were growing out of the common earth that was forming. And none was offended in the least by the presence of the other because their own identities were intact. When you walk in the forest, you see many forms of life, all living together. They each have their own integrity and capability to be different and proud. And I believe there is a future for native and non-native people to work together because of the fundamental fact that we share the same future with the same land that we're on. And he closes his quote by saying, we will never be able to build another planet like the Earth or build a covered bridge to another planet and start all over again. We need to acknowledge that the land is the boss, end quote. Chief Potts' attempt here to try to describe what he saw in the bush and draw meaning from his experiences is an example of a Kinomagewin. This is an example of a Nishnabe legal reasoning, which is aimed at drawing out law 
from real world experiences, not some abstract, idealized, a priori platonic form, but from the physicality, the context that we find ourselves located in. These laws are literally written on the earth. Our legal archives are the escarpments and the water and the rocks and the plants and the birds. And when this is overcut, mind flooded, we find that the earth as a source of legal knowledge and therefore our ability to be able to reason about our responsibilities is likewise diminished. Clear-cutting, mining, flooding of territories can clear away long-established indigenous authorities, precedent. When you get rid of a landscape, in some instances, you burn an entire body of knowledge. This can be said for built cities and industrial development. It gets harder to dry, draw guidance from the earth when the land is nearly devoid of life. Thus, Anishinaabe people sometimes block development within our territories in obedience to our laws to preserve our libraries, to preserve our archives, to preserve our ability to be able to reason authoritatively in the world that is the boss. Now there's one last point I want to make before my conclusion, which is the return of the trickster. Civil disobedience can and clearly has and is being used against indigenous peoples across this land. And it has and does and will continue to lead to oppressive results. We must remember that we should resist falsely characterizing direct action as an indigenous only tactic to secure land, governance, and resources. Direct action and civil disobedience has long been a powerful tool in the hands of non-native people. They are not unambiguously positive for indigenous peoples. Settlers from other countries have often erected blockades and taken actions which exclude us from our lands. It shows that civil disobedience is a double-edged sword it can be turned against indigenous peoples and significantly diminish our freedoms. It is not an ideal form. From the outset, the British acknowledged the problem of settlers taking direct action and displacing indigenous peoples from their lands. As a result, the Royal Proclamation of 1763 and subsequent treaties were de designed to prevent Europeans from blocking indigenous peoples in their territories. The Crown took these actions because unauthorized occupation of indigenous peoples' lands was a very significant problem for the British. Direct action by settlers threatened for the Crown trade, travel, diplomacy, direct action by settlers that the Crown wanted to constrain could even lead to war if the settlers were unrestrained. That's why the Crown took action. Thus, the Royal Proclamation and Treaty of Niagara, which was signed a year later, contains important legal principles protecting indigenous peoples against blockades and direct action. For example, this Royal Proclamation and Treaty of Niagara reserved lands west of the Appalachian height of land as Indian hunting grounds. They were not included in any colony. Non-Indians were expressly forbidden from settling on Indian lands because of, quote, the great frauds and abuses that had been committed by non-Indians. The Crown reserved to itself the exclusive right to negotiate with so-called Indians to facilitate peace and friendship and respect. But as you know, when we come to British Columbia and 
other parts of this country, the proclamation often failed to stifle the expansionist ambitions of non-Indian settlers and speculators. People fluttered over the Appalachians and physically occupied and blocked indigenous peoples from land, contrary to British and indigenous law. This is why it can be said that civil disobedience has a long history amongst settlers in relationship to indigenous lands. In fact, this desire for westward expansion was the primary reason the British, sorry, the 13 American colonies rebelled against the British in 1776. We have the United States of America and British North America because colonists wanted to get their hand on Indian lands and the Crown didn't want them to get that land and forbid that through the Royal Proclamation. So the colonists, in this case the Americans, used direct action and civil disobedience in the American Revolution. It demonstrates how difficult it was to restrain settlers from directly occupying indigenous lands, despite British law to the contrary, the Royal Proclamation. This has also occurred in my territory, which you're like, this is my great, uh, great grandfather there. Our lands were directly occupied. This is my grandfather. Contrary to British and indigenous law, these people signed a treaty dealing with 1.5 million acres of land in southern Ontario, from Godrich to Arthur up to Collingwood and straight up the Bruce Peninsula. But we didn't want to sign a treaty. We wanted to retain the land as our own. But here's what the treaty negotiator for the Crown said. After talking to you all day yesterday and nearly all last night on the subject of your reserve, you have concluded not to cede your land to the government for your benefit. You complain that the whites not only cut and take timber from your land, but they are commencing to settle upon it and can't prevent it. And the negotiator continues to go on, I certainly do not think the government will take the trouble to help you while you remain opposed to your own interest. The government as your guardian has the power to act as it pleases with regard to your reserve. And I will recommend that the whole, excepting the part marked on the map in red, be surveyed and sold for the good of yourselves and your children. The money once secured in your great mother's strong box will be safe to you for future generations. Whereas, if it is not sold, the trees and the land will be taken from you by your white neighbors and your children, and then you will be left without recourse. This is a well-known history in Canada. There are numerous examples of the Crown being unwilling to restrain settlers from taking direct action in disobedience to Canadian law. Throughout southern Ontario, rights to hunt and fish reserved to Indians through treaties were diminished as farmers and merchants physically blocked us from our traditional harvesting sites. That great-great-grandfather that you saw took his first bear about a four-hour car ride away from the reserve on traditional territory, but people were pushed back off that traditional territory contrary to treaty. So, in these circumstances, it is passing ironic that indigenous practices of civil disobedience have received the lion's share of attention because they're not the ones that have actually exercised direct action to its greatest effects. Non-Aboriginal occupation of indigenous lands has long overshadowed indigenous fleeting issues of civil disobedience and direct action. Non-Indigenous civil disobedience has been astonishingly successful in transferring Indigenous land to other peoples. And this continues to the present, despite Indigenous law, despite other legal sources being a part of our law as Canadians. Private land in British Columbia was almost entirely taken up through the non-Aboriginal occupation of Aboriginal lands as settlers were, in, were permitted 
and indeed encouraged to take up Indian lands through preemption. There was no Aboriginal consent to this process. Statutes were passed by the colonial legislature of British Columbia that permitted non-Aboriginal people to legally register land in their own names if they occupied Aboriginal land for a certain period of time and made small improvements, such as building a house or clearing a bush. Disturbingly, preemption was a right denied to Aboriginal peoples by this same legislation in this same period. And this double standard permitted people to occupy Aboriginal lands to the detriment of its original owners. You look at that little postage stamp in Nanaimo. You think of the lands of the people here in Vancouver and down the valley with the little postage stamps that they have as reserves. You think about the Gulf Islands, the Grace Islet dispute that recently occurred off Salt Spring Island. Right. There's a disturbing double standard in play here. Occupations and blockades being the primary mode for the settlement of this province. A form of physical removal created this province despite the existence of both crown law through the Royal Proclamation, and all of the indigenous peoples that live up and down this coast and in this province. This shows that blockades and occupations can be effective even if their morality and their legality is questionable. This cannot be made into a universalized good that we take up at every moment with uncalibrated care. It has real limits. It also has false limits. We need to think about the relationality involved in direct action. Indigenous peoples will not retreat from taking a direct role in trying to construct their place in this world using their own law, though I fear Sometimes the civil disobedience and direct action, which is employed by some indigenous peoples, is contrary to their own laws, as it's picked up in that universalized, decontextualized fashion. But this kind of conflict will continue for some time, and what we need are processes to be able to put this together. So I want to take you back to my opening story Imagine living in a world where your land is ruined and your people are gone. This is not an imaginary scenario like my opening story might have intimated, particularly for First Nations peoples. 250 years ago, 90,000 Salish people lived from Seattle to Vancouver over to Nanaimo. 300 years ago, Anishinaabe and Huron people were present in the same numbers in Ontario. And 100 years after contact, I imagine it felt like that character in the opening story that I was telling you. Populations decimated, environments in collapse, climates changed beyond recognition, all due to direct action Peoples living in this country know what climate change feels like and the destruction of a way of life due to direct action. While many of their laws, indigenous people's laws, have been decimated as libraries have been clear cut, stripped mined, flooded, and otherwise developed, there is still a lot of legal wisdom that remains because indigenous peoples have continued to reason and look at the earth around them and draw through interpretation and through sharing with one another what that means for making decisions, regulating your behavior, resolving our disputes. In other words, indigenous peoples have a law that is 
well acquainted with climate change and collapse. And if we want to take the benefit of that law, it's time we recognize that this is a part of the law of the land that's not just for the Salish and the Anishinaabe and the Cree and the Haudenosaunee, but it's a law that has wisdom that might be able to help others. We are living in a time of renaissance with regard to First Nations law. They are slowly becoming a part of our land again in the more explicit terms. Cases like Chilcotin, mass movements like Idle No More, and the repopulation of our nations are contributing to this change. In closing, I want to sing a song, which is a water song. Because we don't just record and talk about our laws in courts and in parliaments. Our laws are talked about in feasts and potlatches, and they're displayed on button blankets, and they're present in masks, and they're found in stories, and they're found in speeches, and they're written across the sky, and they're also taken up in song. We don't sing in the common law. We don't sing in the civil law. But many cultures sing their law. And it's important to recognize that part of, the, of our walking along the shores of life as water walkers sees us engage these traditions as well. I'm going to sing an Anishinaabemwin. This is a song that was taught to be by my daughter, Lindsay. She received it from Sylvia Plain, who received it from uh, Josephine Mondaman. Um, this song is a part of those water walkers, who are real people, by the way, who have walked across this continent for the past 15 or 20 years, trying to raise awareness and bring attention to the health and the life of our waters. Thank you, John. That was uh, an amazing gift. Thank you so much.
Um, so we have some time left in the room if anyone has questions for John. Yes. I'll, I'll start off. Um, in your personal pictures there, there's a picture of a, a lady holding a baby. Is that uh, your grandmother? Or is that you? you might That's me and my mom. Sorry, I was just <laughs> The second question I had was, um, how do you see Isle No More in that movement, which brings together people from different nations and relies on the new ways for people to stay in touch? Uh, how does that form of protest uh, tie in with um, the Aboriginal traditional forms of protest that you yes. refer to? Is there, is, there, is there a match there, or, and where do you see that movement yeah. kind of? So, so Idle No More is actually a good illustration of the kinds of things that I was talking about because it tried to cultivate and develop relationality and there was a, a spirit of joy and happiness that was often associated with people gathering together that was uh, non-violent and there was the singing that occurred as people took up their drums, there was the round dances that occurred that mimic the circle of life. Uh, you had people bringing into a public space uh, very indigenous ways of trying to communicate the importance of relationality uh, not only to one another as indigenous peoples but to all our friends and relatives that are living here plus uh, those that uh, are gone, our ancestors. This is the ancestral graveyard on my reserve. Um, they also participated. This question down here. Uh, I was just thinking, uh, when you were talking about the button blankets, I consider this like the new button blanket. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's uh, directly in relation to uh, Northern Gateway and to the Unistoten clan's uh, blockade. Do you have anything that you would like to say about their political work? Sure. Um, First of all, I want to acknowledge one of the students I uh, had as a graduate student at the University of Victoria. Her name was Maxine Maddelpe, and she came from the north of Vancouver Island, uh, Kwagio of person. And she produced a piece of work called a button blanket pedagogy. And in order to put her master's uh, thesis together, she went to her community and she talked with people within her community, and they engaged in the process of, of um, producing 11 button blankets. And in following that pattern, it wasn't just the product that came out of the end that was important, although that is like a statute or a, a decision or a judgment. There's something legislative that's marked on that blanket, but there's a legal process that she followed in putting that blanket together as well. Right? There's, there's, this is kind of a, almost a legislative, behind the scenes kind of action where there's talking with one another, there's sewing, there's recovering the stories, they're talking about who has the right to which uh, area in accordance with the clan that they might be a part of. And when she made this presentation of remote and blanket pedagogy, she had a room that was maybe about a quarter of the size of this room, but, uh, and she had the blankets all around. But under the table, she had people sewing the button blanket, and then she had little children underneath who were playing as the button blanket was being sewn. In other words, it's not just putting the button on a vest or the button on a blanket that's an important part of that law. It's what you do, it's the civil procedure, in other words, that you do in getting to that stage. How are you creating relationships? And so, in relationship to the uh, disputes and protests that are taking he place here, I'm not as fully apprised of them as I should be, but one of the things that I'm hoping is occurring is that Indigenous peoples and allies are picking up this process of putting buttons on things and developing relationships with one another that are learning from the earth, and then they're using that precedent, standard, authority, as they then approach the corporations and governments that want to allow this development to occur. Right? Because it's not just about force. In fact, it's probably not anything about force. It's probably about taking those laws and having them be persuasively put into that scenario in a fashion that creates another kind of compulsion. Not the compulsion of chains and prisons 
and uh, spiking trees. But the compulsion of those seven grandfathers that I talked about, respect and love and kindness and wisdom, humility and courage and truth. And so I'm not going to speak to the specific here because I just don't know enough. But I know that there are laws in place here that can continue to grow in relationship to uh, these conflicts that we see. Thank you, John. That was wonderful. I always learn so much from you. Um, is a pipeline a form of civil disobedience? Yeah, it is. It's the trickster, right? The, it, we think that this is happening um, in accordance uh, with Canadian law, at one way of looking at this. But the point I'm trying to make to you is that Canadian law doesn't just include what Parliament says and what the courts have to say about it. There's also laws that Indigenous peoples have that are there of their own, but they also can be recognized and affirmed under Section 35 of the Constitution, which is Canada's highest law. And it seems to me that the way that this is proceeding is not only in disobedience to Indigenous peoples' laws on the ground, Haida, Salish, Simpson, uh, Heltzik, etc. It's also in disobedience to um, even the Crown's own laws, the Royal Proclamation of 1763, or all of the other principles in place to restrain uh, that kind of undemocratic, non-participatory uh, ways of proceeding. Hi, Professor Rose, thank you uh, for sharing all that you have today so far. Um, I'm an organizer with the divestment campaign here on campus. Uh, so as you know, and others uh, on, in this room may know, UVic and uh, UBC have had uh, uh, referendums, faculty referendums that have called uh, their universities to divest from the university. At SFU here, we're having a panel discussion next week on the question, what is the role of the university in society today as it faces climate impacts? And uh, um, so I wanted to ask you to speak a little on um, what you think the role of the university is um, with reference to the indigenous law and reference to kind of things that are going on in the world today. Thank you. Thank you. So I think divestment can be a, a helpful strategy if it's very carefully calibrated again and thought of in relationship to precise contexts. I do worry about divestment as another kind of abstract, false, wow, that's a strong word, universalized, a priori, a decontextualized way of operating in the world. Because it may be that divestment at one level sal solves our conscience because there are many terrible things that are being uh, invested in that need to stop, and we, sh we could feel and should feel when it's properly, when divestment occurs well, um, that we've done a good thing in the world. But divestment can also be very, very um, abusive and damaging and harsh and challenging for people in communities that uh, want to see uh, some development of, of certain kinds happening within their homelands. And suddenly, uh, they're shut out of having housing and food and um, services for sewage and, and water because they don't have any ability at hand uh, to be able to make provision for how um, they might get along in the world. So I, I'm, I'm really not an absolutist person, as you can tell. Um, I do think that the emphasis is right, that by and large divestment uh, um, should really be scrutinized and um, there should be uh, a lot of places that we divest from that would then encourage corporate behavior that's much better than we see now or it would stop corporate uh, action in some places where it needs to be stopped. But I really worry about a generalized, uh, abstract uh, 
sometimes fundamentalist, universalized approach to divestment that thinks we can solve all the answers in the world because we have this form in mind that will give us, I, I, relationality is a messy affair. And, uh, um, and so that's, it's basically the way I would try to work through that. And that's harder to do, is, is be case by case by case. Sometimes methods get lost, messages get lost, and the politics gets sort of uh, diminished when you get into the, the dollars and cents of the place and trying to work that through. But I think we can sustain a politics through that, and we can be more careful in that regard. I worked with a group as on their board, uh, First Peoples Worldwide, and you can Google their work. They have a divestment strategy um, and a set of criteria that goes into making those decisions, which um, you know, takes account of Aboriginal people's own desires for development, but also balances that against, calibrates that against you know, uh, environmental and other issues. I'm running the room like Phil Donahue here, just a second. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. My question is, uh, how, how does United Nations uh, recognize the indigenous laws and how does it compare with indigenous laws in Africa or Asia or Europe and Australia? And I just wanted to ask you, is it possible to translate the song you sang? Sure. Because I love the river. Okay, so the song is uh, Water, Nibe, um, uh, Gezage Go, uh, We Love You, Gi Mi Gwechewe Neme Go, We Give Thanks for You, Gi Jewe Nima Neme Go, We um, 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 Have Compassion in the Way We Relate to You. So that's the translation. It's a, it's a translation of honoring. Uh, the water and, and directing our thoughts and behaviors towards the water in that fashion. International law and comparative law has a lot to do with this question. Um, there's the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that uh, contains uh, some of the things that I've been talking about today, that Indigenous Peoples have laws, they have structures of governments by which they can organize these laws, um, they have uh, rights to be able to educate their communities and societies and find respect of those laws. They have rights to free prior and informed consent when uh, development is being proposed on their lands, which goes to the divestment question, right? If, if, is, if there's not free and prior and informed consent, then there's no question that divestment could be a very good strategy there. But uh, sometimes there is a free and prior and informed consent that you might find. Comparative law is also huge. Um, when you work in a legal system like I do, not, you reason by way of analogy. I talked about indigenous legal systems reasoning by way of analogy by looking at the earth. Common law legal system reasons by way of analogy to looking at other stories. And those other stories are often what's found in cases that the common law has told. But sometimes you look beyond the borders of your own country to find other helpful stories that you can pull in or distinguish what you are seeing there. And so. The, I've enjoyed uh, teaching in the United States for the past five years, learning about tribal courts and what's happening in that country and seeing what not to do, as well as some things to do. And I make this judgment that the United States is doing better than Canada in relation to indigenous peoples. Um, done the same thing in Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia. I mean, this is part of the world of working with indigenous law is finding guidance and wisdom in other places as well. Time for one more question. I'm going to give it to Caleb here so he gets to drop the mic when he's done. Musty Cho, my name is Caleb Bain. I acknowledge my presence in the Sea Coast Salish Territory. John, you said taking direct action for constructing how to live and constructing our relational structures you know, and describing kind of us taking responsibility for it. How would you characterize then things like Bill C-51 and the stifling of dissent, the strategic, tactical application of very coercive laws and, and yes. opaque laws? And in particular, I mean, there's the kind of the legal implications of that and what it means to kind of this rich discourse, but also from a spiritual perspective. Yeah. When you are muzzled 
in this way, in, in the indigenous law context? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Well, we know from other omnibus legislation, this is the most recent example, that that doesn't often survive scrutiny in the courts of this land. So it may be, and I believe this is the case in this instance, that these laws are being passed contrary to Canadian law. And so they'll be on the books through Parliament for a few years, perhaps, but they cannot survive. They're illegal? I don't know if that's the <laughs> proper word in the um, formal uh, common law sense, but they do not accord with our highest aspirations as Canadians, as set out in their Charter of Rights and Freedoms. They certainly do not accord with Salish, and I would guess Haida, and Anishinaabe, and Blackfoot, and Mi'kmaq law. And so there's something wrong with them from that uh, perspective as well. And then you asked me the question about from a spiritual side. Um, I just was on a defense this past week from the University of Manitoba. Someone, Jenny Wastesakut, defended her PhD in Cree law and spirituality and wrote a beautiful uh, kind of 300 page piece of work to show that that spirituality can go towards informing um, w the way Cree governance and law could function in the present context. But I also worry about spirituality being thrown around too lightly, not only in the world that we live in as we look at other countries and some of the ways that spirituality is used to deny and undermine other people's human rights. Um, in an indigenous context, I worry about indigenous spirituality um, creating an abstract way of approaching how we should live in the world that's detached from context, that doesn't take account of the physicality. I do, metaphysics can be helpful, but metaphysics has to be correlated with physics and our physical lives as well. And so I, I don't think myself, I could deny my own spiritual feelings and that which I see in the world that's motivated by spirituality, but I want to be hugely cautious at the same time as I hopefully am respectful and hopefully even embrace those instances where I find um, that it's not uh, another absolutist thing that uh, gets set up that denies us our freedom and our ability to relate with one another. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. That was really interesting. A little gift for you. Um, And thank you everyone for attending again and listening and asking good questions. Our next and last talk is April 9th with uh, Tamil Campos and Brigitte de Pape. I uh, hope you join us again. Thank you. <laughs>